Turned over to look through the papers this morning with the broadcaster Tanya Breyer, probably expert Martin Roberts here as well. Okay. Let's have a look at the times, yes. should we, first and foremost. Because oh, this is a bit depressing. Oh, gosh. All the are running out of gas. Yeah, if it isn't cold enough um, and we're struggling with this just terrific weather, um, when they're now saying that we're going to run out of gas, so we're going to be chopping up the furniture to keep ourselves warm. Um, apparently, allegedly, amazingly for 2013, Britain has only two days worth of gas reserves left. Uh, and apparently, uh, on a good day, we have a maximum of 15 days, when other parts of Europe, such as France and Germany, have a 100 day supply in reserve. We have 15 at max. But because it's been so cold, and we've all been putting on our... Um, our, our whatever we use to heat ourselves, um, we've only got two days of energy left. So, um, yeah, a bit of a worry. Not it's not very reassuring, is it? <laughs> I just can't believe! Is it that <laughs> yeah. What does that mean in real terms? Well, uh, what can you do? I mean, it's not like, you, know, you can't go and store it in your garage, can you? I'll tell you what, I'll just fill the kettle up. I mean, so it's it means really that what they are going to actually do is they'll probably start cutting down on business use of gas first. Because business users, obviously, are the highest users of gas. And so hopefully we won't be in a situation where you turn the cooker or your gas fire on and it won't start. I don't think that's going to happen. But it's just a bit yeah, like things to do is to try and build a bit more storage, I think. Yeah, well, they do talk about it more on the countryside, according to yeah. the Telegraph. Wow, well, the Daily Telegraph has got hold of a, a recording of a meeting which Nick Bowles, the planning minister, had uh, with um, several property developers. I think it was yesterday. Um, in which he was quoted amongst other, <laughs> other things as saying he couldn't care who owns the bloody things, meaning land and stuff. And he's basically um, saying to uh, these property developers that, uh, sit with it guys, I'm going to relax the rules in terms of planning and you're going to be able to do all those things which, which you've been predicted but stopped from doing uh, for the last uh, few years, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, however long planning laws have been in place. And, and actually, in order to fulfil the, the whole new build uh, homes scenario, which obviously has been very much part of the budget this year, uh, they're going to relax lots of rules in terms of planning. And the, the, both sides uh, uh, of the equation have got something to say on this in terms of what is this going to do to the countryside on the one hand? Can you do this without damaging the countryside and, 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 and blighting the landscape? I mean, I travel around the country obviously filming and, and seeing all sorts of planning decisions which, you know, or, or the mess that if it goes wrong that, that, that it can create. Um, and there's brownfield sites out there that you can build on, stuff that's already had stuff constructed so already. So the fear is that the countryside is, is going to suffer, and I just hope there's a way of doing it where we can get, you know, the, 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 the housing market on, on its feet again, but without destroying uh, the countryside or relaxing the rules too much. It's a, it's a concern that, it's a, I mean, obviously the, there's a lot of advantage to using brownfield sites, but is it at the time when we're, we haven't got any money already, but it's the clean-up cost, the decontamination cost of some brownfields. Uh, well, you're talking about a very specific type of brownfield where there are contamination issues, but there's lots of brownfield sites which has just had old housing on it, or in some cases commercial developments, which hasn't got any of the sort of contamination issues which you talk about. So, you know, there's enough brownfield sites to start with where we can go at those first without having to damage the countryside. Um, Martin... Mortgage lenders. Yeah, lots of excitement in the budget, obviously, about uh, the proposals to try and you know boost the housing market and anything which releases funds to enable people to buy homes, especially first-time buyers, I'm completely in support of. But it seems that some of the mortgage lenders are turning around and saying, um, might you actually talk to us a bit more before you actually came up with this idea, because I'm not actually sure it's going to work. Um, there are two schemes which are being proposed. One is, is where the, the government's actually offering interest-free loans uh, to help... Uh, people who are buying new homes and, that, and obviously a lot of those would be first time buyers. The second scheme is going to be applicable to anybody who wants to buy a property, take out a loan, when as we know at the moment it's, it's really hard to get the deposit and the government are going to underwrite uh, a significant portion of any loan so that lenders will be more likely to come along and say okay well I'll actually give that loan. There's a lot of concern this means that some people maybe use it to buy second homes, that the money might not necessarily go to the right place. And, and the mortgage lender saying, how exactly are we going to administer this? Um, well, I'm not mean, sure. Does it bring, I mean, obviously the, the whole subprime mortgage market thing was, was primarily in the States, but it was all about giving money to people who ultimately yeah. couldn't pay it back. Yeah, could this right. have, and this feels the same. It, it absolutely. It feels there are, same. There, are people, there are also people who are saying, is this going to is this going to create another little mini housing boom? Which on the one hand is good, but on the, on the other side, 
Yeah, it does make I'll it tell you what, Let's have a look at this incredible bit of um, of history. Oh, this, yeah, that's uh, amazing. Almost the full Beatles it signatures. Incredible. Well, Fifty years ago, this lady went to a concert, a Beatles concert. And she got all the Beatles at the time, including Pete Best, who was the drummer at the time, to sign a ticket. Um, and her friend actually got, the, got them to sign it. And then her friend ripped the ticket in half, kept the signature of Paul McCartney, and oh. gave this lady <laughs> half the ticket, which has got George Harrison and John Lennon and, as I said, Pete Best. Now, this lady's going to auction this ticket today. But she's trying to make contact with Maureen Bradley. If you're out there, Maureen, trying this is a good opportunity half. to get the other half. Because apparently her bit with the John Lennon and, and all those things is worth about one and a half to two thousand pounds. If she had the whole ticket, so if the two of them can get together, it's worth five thousand pounds. So there's a debt, but the, the auction's today. It'd be quite interesting if they go. did auction them separately and see which one. Well, well, well let's let's get, get, get the get Beatles. Yeah, Maureen Bradley's out there. She needs to do something quickly. Get in touch. Let's hope we do. Look, it's been great to see you. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Good to see you this morning.